Okay, um, so I'm going to go ahead and get started. Um, got a few different announcements for you um, that um, hopefully will be some useful information and then we can get started into the slides. Um, so remember that your PRR assignment is due today by 5. Um, it looks like some of you guys have it for me, so you can give it to me at the end of class. Um, you're also welcome to email it, um, and hopefully you'll see both today and also some on Monday, different places where it ties in, because it ties into both of those topics. Um, but we do need to talk a little bit about some upcoming schedule details. Um, so if I look at the Moodle site and I pull up um, the schedule, you can see that, yes, I am behind. Um, so we're actually talking about this T-cell activation stuff today on October 27th. The PRR assignment is due. Um, on um, Monday, we're going to be talking about peripheral T-cell subsets because we're talking about peripheral T-cell subsets and not discussing a paper. We will not have discussion questions to you. Um, we are going to discuss a paper on Wednesday, um, and there are some discussion questions due for that paper. Um, I went back and forth on only about a million papers here. Um, I ended up with kind of one of my old favorites, um, it has the question, there are a little few more questions than there usually are, so I made the questions worth 20 points instead of 10. Also, because I may, because I'm behind, have to cut some other discussion paper, and I don't want you to lose out on getting those discussion paper points, since they tend to be um, points that are helping you for your grade. Um, and so you'll actually will have the same number of discussion paper points <laughs> due that were due, but it's just based on this one paper. Um, and... It's a, I find this paper really fun. I think there's a lot to talk about with this paper. Um, we can talk about sort of some big picture details uh, of this paper. And then, of course, on Friday of next week, um, we have uh, exam two. Um, we have lots of materials for exam two um, posted on um, Moodle. So hopefully that will help you. Um, I also sent you a doodle poll with some possible times for a review session. Um, I would really like it if you could reply to that by um, like Saturday at 11.59 p.m. I would say 11.59 instead of midnight because then everyone wants to know if it's like the midnight that starts Saturday or midnight that ends Saturday. So uh, 11.59 p.m. on Saturday. Um, and the reason is because I, some of the options were on Sunday and so I needed to know before Sunday. Um, so there's some options on Sunday, and then basically all the other options are different nights at like 7 next week because my schedule is nutty. Um, it will most likely be a Zoom review session, uh, question answer based, just like the last one. Uh, everything's really similar to the last one, but please respond to that um, doodle poll when you can. If you think about um, exam two, and if you look at the old exam twos, basically, um, we are, this exam covers everything starting from the sort of T-cell MHC material, so all of MHC and antigen presentation and everything we've said about T-cells, so it stops before B-cell development. If you look at old versions, sometimes I've gotten to this peripheral B-cell stuff, sometimes I haven't in different years, so you will see that on some old exams. It's not relevant this year, so don't freak out about that. Um, but sometimes um, exam two for this class can be a little overwhelming for people because um, there is a lot of material. Um, and so um, I decided for um, this exam, I'm going to give you, let you guys have an index card of notes. And I, I picked these ones because they were I like this size better than the smaller ones that I had. I had like smaller white ones or I had these that were a little bigger, so I picked these. I wasn't so sure I was like ready for a whole sheet of paper, but I figured the index card I was good with. Um, and so one thing I'll tell you just from a teaching perspective, so you guys can you know take one. I don't care what color it is. Um, 
Uh, from a teaching perspective, um, this sort of thing, actually, there's a lot of evidence on this being really good for learning. Um, and one of the reasons why the evidence is that it's really good for learning is that it makes you um, look at like look back at your old material and prioritize what's particularly important. That's part of why I go with like index card versus like a whole paper or like a 27 page study guide. Um, if you actually have to like look at the material and think about it and say what was the most important, what's the things that I definitely should write down, that that act actually helps you more than the, the card usually does. Um, so it's actually a good thing to do. It hopefully should help you and should also help you feel a little less anxiety going into this exam. And I'm telling you the whole week in advance so that you can be working on putting that together as you're working on your studying. Um, I also tell you that uh, sort of pedagogy thing about how I know that actually the thing I'm giving you is the help with the studying and the fact that prepping this is helpful. Um, it should please have something handwritten. Don't like have something like typed on it or something. Um, I say that because I remember I was a champ when I was allowed to bring in a piece of paper at using the photocopier to like take my super huge amounts of notes and like shrink them with the photocopier to make them into one page. And now that I understand this whole process, I know that that was like the most defeating the point way I could possibly have done things. Um, but I'm, so I'm telling you all of this because just realize that um, this is actually there's data showing that this kind of thing is actually a really good studying strategy of having to prioritize. And so even for classes in the future, other people's classes where they might not let you bring in an index card, it's actually a really good thing to to do for prep. So um, I both recommend it for other things for prep and for this exam. Um, you are welcome to uh, have one of I don't know what size that is, the biggie, the bigger size index card, <laughs> whatever size that is. Um, so. Uh, that's that information. Um, and if we look at Moodle, you can see that um, I've got a paper by Bira from 2016. That's the one we're going to be discussing on Wednesday of next week. Um, and here are the questions um, that are due about that paper. Um, so uh, I think those are all the announcements I had to make. Um, so like I said, remember to... Um, answer that doodle poll. Um, today we're going to continue our discussion of T cell activation. And if you recall last time, we really spent a lot of time talking about this first signal, signal one coming from the T cell receptor in order to turn on T cell receptor signaling. Um, but I've mentioned to you that there are some other signals listed here as signals two and signals three um, that are particularly important for activating a T cell, especially when activating a naive T cell for the first time that it sees antigen out outside of the thymus. And so remember that in some ways we're kind of following a T cell that left the thymus. It's going to be seeing antigen for the first time. And in um, so doing, it really is going to need all of these interactions to make a great, to be a fully activated good T cell. Um, one part of this, um, of course, is the T cell receptor signaling or signal one that we talked about last time. One part of this involves signals from some cytokines. We're going to see a little bit about cytokine stuff today, and we're going to see a lot about cytokines on Monday. Um, and we specifically were thinking about um, the cytokine IL-2 last time. So remember that our cell that is not activated, um, you know, has the IL-2 gene, but it's not actually transcribing it or translating it or making IL-2. But if we get signaling through the T cell receptor, like we saw last time, we'll start transcribing IL-2 will in fact start translating the IL-2 protein, make that IL-2 protein, um, and that will bind to the IL-2 receptor to help um, further activate the T cell and allow for T cell activation and T cell proliferation. Um, IL-2 was originally described as T cell growth factor, so it's really key for proliferation and um, leading to that activation for T cells. 
And you can think of it as sort of the cy a big cytokine for that signal three. Um, and it is sort of the cytokine for T cells in general. Um, there are some specific situation T cell cytokines that are Monday's problem. Um, you can also note that um, we can see the T cell or the, the IL-2 receptor here. Um, and we do have this additional chain that an activated cell can start making so that it can really soak up the IL-2 and get this signal really well. And that will, in fact, start coming from signal one as well. So we'll start making this alpha chain of the um, IL-2 receptor to really be able to soak up um, IL-2 well. That chain, it will uh, be mentioned briefly in some other context, context. Um, so I will just tell you that that little blue chain on the IL-2 receptor that's shown here is also known as CD25. Um, and CD25 is sometimes an important, um, it allows a cell to make the high affinity uh, IL-2 receptor. Um, it's really important for allowing a cell to kind of like really soak up IL all the IL-2. You can kind of imagine if a cell has CD25, it could potentially be an IL-2 hog. Um, and we're going to see CD25 um, come up again a little bit on Monday. So I'm pointing it out here. You actually have already seen CD25 when we were talking about DN1 through DN4 cells in um, the thymus during development. CD25 is one of the markers used on uh, for distinguishing different types of double negative cells, but we didn't really get into uh, details of it there. Um, whether we're thinking about IL-2 signaling through the IL-2 receptor or whether we're thinking about really pretty much any other cytokine, we see pretty similar types of um, signaling that happen as a result of the cytokine receptors. And so I want to tell you a little bit about that signaling. It's going to really surprise you. There's going to be some kinases. There's going to be some phosphorylation. There's going to be some transcription factor. Um, same kind of themes you've seen before. Um, and at the beginning, our cytokine receptor will usually be in multiple parts that are diffusing around the membrane separately from one another. And you can see, oh my gosh, our IL-2 receptor is actually multiple parts. They're not usually always stuck together like this. So usually we've got multiple parts of our cytokine receptor, whichever cytokine receptor it is. And that cytokine receptor is um, associated with a protein that is um, associated with its cytoplasmic domain. Um, and so, of course, when the cytokine is around, that brings the chains of the receptor into next to each other, it forces them next to each other, and that means that these cytoplasmic domains um, with this tightly associated kinase get pushed together as well, and the kinases are in induced proximity. And so now the kinases can phosphorylate each other. The kinase, the kinase that's listed here is listed as Jack. Um, in reality, there are four different kinds of jacks. So there's like jack one, jack two, jack three, and tick two, because why could anything be simple? So you just need to know it's a jack here. One of the reasons why I specifically mentioned that there are a few different jacks, and I'm specifically kind of pointing this out right now, um, is that um, in recent years, there have been some drugs that inhibit jacks. So there have been some jack inhibitor drugs that have been Associated. I actually opened up my PowerPoint and was like tweaking it last night, and the first commercial that came on TV was for a jack inhibitor drug. Um, so there are a bunch of jack inhibitor drugs that are treating some autoimmune and autoinflammatory diseases, and we'll see that some of them later. Um, they actually are have a not great side effect profile, and they're not like the first choice for a lot of uh, these disease states. But um, and part of it's because jacks do so many things um, and with so many cytokines, um, but Jack inhibitors are actually like the current hot thing um, in uh, a lot of aspects of pharma. Um, Jack is sort of has an interesting, like why it's called Jack is kind of interesting. 
Um, and because there are two stories for wh- why it's called Jack. If you look in a textbook, if you read any immunology literature, you will find a story for why this protein is called Jack. And the reason, the thing that you will find is that you will find that um, this protein has two different sort of key parts to it. It has kind of this part that's shown here as being a little more flat and a part that's shown here as being a little more dented, right? And the flat part is enzymatically active. It's able to phosphorylate things. The K is kinase. And so we've got this kinase part. And then we also have this piece, which is kind of like a binding site for phosphorylated tyrosines. And so these jacks can phosphorylate each other when they're brought into proximity, and they can also bind to each other when they're phosphorylated. And so the idea was that these kinases had two faces. They had a face that got phosphorylated and a face that did phosphorylating. And so the uh, naming for these kinases is that they're, that they got the name Jack for Janus kinase because Janus was a Roman god with two faces. And so the idea was that they had two faces, and so they were the Janus kinases. That's the story you hear from every, from a whole lot of people. I have been told by some really old immunologists who were like in the field working on this stuff at that time that that story is baloney. And that that story is something that people like thought of afterwards when they learned more about the proteins and they're like, oh, let's make this whole thing up. Uh, and they tell me that, um, and this is, tr- this is, this part is at least true, that, um, these kinases were found in some patients with really bad immunodeficiency, like in skid that I told you about last time. There are some skid patients that have mutations in these, so they can't do signaling downstream of cytokines. They can't make adaptive immune responses. And they had these patients with autoimmune disease, and they were trying to sort of figure out what is this uh, gene that's mutated, what is this protein that's changed, and what is this, this protein must be super important in the immune system, and we want to figure out what it does. And so they did a whole bunch of work to find out what it does, and they were sad when they found out what it was because they thought it was going to be more interesting than it was. And they were sad, and they're like, oh, my gosh, I can't believe this. We found just another kinase. And so if you ask really old immunologists, they tell you that JAK stands for just another kinase. Um, and that in the back, then that people, like, took later on and were like, no, it stands for Janus kinase. And, like, because of the two faces thing. Um, you can decide for yourself what you want it to stand for. Um, but the moral of the story is this is the kinase. Uh, these are the kinases that get brought together with cytokine receptors. They phosphorylate one another um, and bind together. But just like with any of our other situations where we're talking about phosphorylated tyrosines, um, when all of those tyrosines are phosphorylated both on the jacks and elsewhere on the receptor, that gives us a new binding site to bring in a new partner. Um, You can see this new partner who's going to bind to this binding site listed here called STAT. Um, And so you can see the STATs can bind to those phosphorylated tyrosines on the jack and on the receptor. When that happens, the the STATs also get phosphorylated. When the stats are phosphorylated, they combine to each other. Also, there's really six different kinds of stats. Stats one, two, three, four. I think it's 5A and 5B. They're not numbered one through six, but you want them to be. Anyway, doesn't matter. We're just calling it stat (laughs) at this point. Um, The stats get phosphorylated. The stats bind to each other and then go directly to the nucleus and act as a transcription factor. Um, so, so this is the entire signaling pathway. Um, so all cytokines signal through a, a signaling pathway known as the jack stat pathway. And if you remember that all cytokines signal through the jack stat pathway, you have memorized the entire pathway. 
because you have the receptor, the jack, and the stat. And that's it. Um, this stat is itself the transcription factor that goes into the nucleus. In fact, stat te technically stands for signal transducer and activator of transcription. And because we've got different jacks and different stats, we can actually get some combos and that get like different things for different cytokines. But for our purposes, just know jack stat is what's going on with cytokine receptors. Um, our main kind of issue that we're going to be thinking about today, however, is this other piece of information that is really important in T cell activation. So T cells, and specifically here I'm talking about naive T cells that are seeing antigen for the first time, naive T cells don't just need this signal one for their activation, this T cell receptor signal, they also need a second signal called signal two. And so we're gonna talk about signal two um, for uh, a bunch of the rest of the time today, and signal two is sort of very much related to um, information in your PRR assignment. Um, in the past, when I was telling you about antigen presentation, I did a quick mention of dendritic cells being really important. And I mentioned to you that dendritic cells are the cells that are the best at turning on naive T cells. The big reason why dendritic cells are so important is because dendritic cells are really good at providing signal two. And so for the next couple of slides, I'm actually going to be telling you some stuff about dendritic cells um, and dendritic cell kind of production of signal two. So then, and then we'll move into kind of what's going on on the T cell side of this. Um, and in future years, I'm putting these slides in a different place because I really wanted them in another lecture a little while ago, but this is what we got. Um, so dendritic cells are found in many tissues throughout the body. If you, um, you can sort of see it from this cartoon. Um, you can look at some other images of dendritic cells. They have really long little processes coming off of them. Um, when I see that, one of the first things I know is that they probably aren't spending huge amounts of time in the blood, circulating around the bloodstream, because if they were, that sheer force that we've been talking about would just rip those arms right off. Um, but they can live in tissues really well. And these dendritic cells are really important, sort of, they, they themselves are innate immune cells, but their key role is turning on adaptive immune cells, especially naive T cells. Um, and dendritic, one of the things that dendritic cells can do really well is that dendritic cells can pick up antigens in different locations in the body, and dendritic cells can actually carry those antigens into secondary lymphoid organs. Um, the dendritic cells will usually be traveling through um, the lymph vessels in that location, and um, they will be using some similar trafficking molecules and steps to the trafficking steps we talked about earlier this week. If you were to look around the bo your body right now, you would find that you have a lot of dendritic cells in a lot of different locations, but that most of those dendritic cells might look something like this dendritic cell in the upper left here which is known as an immature dendritic cell. So you have a lot of immature dendritic cells throughout your body right now. Um, and those immature dendritic cells are amazing at phagocytosis and other types of internalization. So they're just pick, eating everything. <laughs> They're not making a ton of MHC. Um, they're just kind of hanging out in the body and they're just kind of phagocytosing stuff. However, if that dendritic cell 
happens to pick something up that stimulates one of its PRRs, if we have some kind of PAMP stimulating a PRR, then that dendritic cell is going to become activated. We're not going to have an immature dendritic cell anymore. That dendritic cell is going to be mature. Going to get this nice stretchy phenotype. And one of the things that you can notice about the difference in the dendritic cell is that now it has a whole lot more surface area, right? Has a whole lot more membrane. And if you were to zoom in on that membrane, you would see that that membrane has way more proteins on its surface than it did before. So we've started, we've started putting all sorts of proteins on the surface. And so now you've got this cell that has a lot of surface and a lot of stuff on the surface which is going to really help to turn on a T cell if possible. And this cell is also going to move when it gets activated. It's going to basically start moving itself into secondary lymphoid organs. So if, if there's a PRR, that dendritic cell is going to be like, whoa, I caught something. Let me take it to the lymph node. And let me stop doing phagocytosis. Stop just picking stuff up go to the lymph node and stimulate anything I can stimulate. Um, and so we're going to see this dendritic cell maturation. Um, you can see this process happening here as well. We've got some dendritic cells just living in the tissues. Um, if they pick something up, they might travel into the lymph node where they might then be able to turn on T cells. Um, this is happening, uh, at least some of their trafficking is happening because of uh, chemokines, and you can see this dendritic cell is really going to start making a whole bunch of cell surface proteins. And those cell surface proteins are why dendritic cells are really, really good at activating T cells. They are the all stars at activating T cells, particularly in activating naive T cells and helping that naive T cell learn how to become an active T cell. So if we want that T cell to be turned on really well, we very generally have, to, we very often have to have a dendritic cell. And it's just because the dendritic cells have like all this bling in order to turn on T cells really well. Um, and so you can see some examples of that here. Um, and again, you're seeing kind of the same ways that dendritic cells activate here. This slide does not go in this location whatsoever. Um, so one of those things that the dendritic cell will start to make is this protein that's listed here as B7. Um, and B7 is our signal 2 protein, um, also known as our co-stimulatory protein or our co-stimulatory molecule. As you will see, um, there are lots of co-stimulatory molecules in reality. I'm not going to like tell you tons of details about every single one that exists because there's so many. Um, and when we think, so B7 is perhaps the most famous of them. And so we're going to see B7 as being, a, we're going to see B7 a lot. Um, we're going to see, like, I'm going to call out the names of two other ones at some point, but B7 is sort of the, the famous one that we're going to think about. Um, technically, there are two B7s. So there's one called B7-1 and B7-2. Um, B7-2 is actually really useful, but we don't care. We're just, gonna, we're just B7 to us. <laughs> um, and they these two proteins are also known as CD80 and CD86. So B71 is also known as CD80. B72 is also known as CD86. And so in one of the papers that you were looking at for the PRR assignment in the Medzitoff paper, they are actually measuring B7 in one of their um, figures. And so B7 is going to be made by our dendritic cell, and that is going to bind to a ligand on our naive T cell in order to um, turn that T cell on fully. And you can see that B7 
binds to a protein called CD28 on the T cell. And so we've got B7 interacting with CD28, and that is providing signal two for our T cell. Um, and our, if it is a naive T cell, that naive T cell must receive a signal from um, the T cell receptor, signal one, and a signal from CD28 or signal two in order to be fully activated. Um, and we can think about this in a couple different ways. Um, cause there's, this is like super, 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 super important for a bunch of things going forward. So if you really get what's going on here, you're going to be in good shape for a lot of things as we move forward. So one thing that we can think about is why the dendritic cell is going, is making B7. Why does it decide, you know what? Today, I would like to make some B7. And the reason why our dendritic cell makes B7, which is a type of co-stimulatory molecule, is because there was some kind of PRR signaling in that dendritic cell. So some kind of PRR tripped that dendritic cell and said, there's something foreign here. There's something that is from a microbe here. You, dendritic cell, should make some B7. There is a little bit of controversy here. This is actually one place in this uh, semester I always think is a little funny because when I was an undergraduate, there were these two sort of ideas in immunology that there, there were the that were like really out. Like everyone really hated them. And like if you believed them, everyone would laugh at you. And they both had a word associated with them. And both of those words I like learned I was never supposed to say. And today I'm going to say one and on Monday I'm going to say the other one. And both every time I say either of them, I feel like I'm going to get struck by lightning. So I'm I'm going to explain this to you cuz it it's a it's a good way of explaining the theory even though this word got controversial. So we're just going to say it and not get struck by lightning. It's going to be great. Um, so what the idea is, is that the dendritic cell, because it's something triggered its PRR, knows there was something dangerous around. There was a microbe. And so the dendritic cell has sensed danger, known as a danger signal. Look at how many times I said the word danger and haven't been struck by lightning. Um, so our, our um, dendritic cell has sensed microbeness foreignness. There is danger. I need to be able to activate a T cell really, really well. Um, and that also leads us to thinking about this other situation. Because you might say, well, okay, but Dr. Barker, like, that's cool that the dendritic cell knows it sensed a thing from a microbe and knows there was danger, but like, I don't really care that much. I don't think this is all that important. Because we still have signal one. We still have a peptide being presented to a T cell receptor, right? Why is it that this peptide being presented to the T cell receptor, why is that not good enough? Why do we need more? Why do we need this danger signal too? And we can think about the answer to this. And again, this is one of those things that if you get this, your life for much of the rest of the semester is so much easier. Let's imagine a dendritic cell is not infected with something from a microbe. Okay? So it doesn't have anything dangerous. Does that dendritic cell present any peptides on MHC class 1 or MHC class 2? Where I see head shakes of different directions. Does that dendritic cell present uh, present anything on MHC? It's not infected. If I see some yes, and the answer is yes. Remember, 
We are presenting self-peptides all the time, especially on class one. So your uninfected cell is presenting all sorts of peptides, particularly on class one, right? To kind of be like, hey, T-cell, am I okay? Hey, T-cell, am I okay? And that means, in theory, if there were T-cells around that were self-reactive, and that presentation was happening, those T cells could get turned on, right? And you could turn on T cells in response to all the self stuff. And what would happen if you turned on T cells in response to all the self stuff? Yeah. Bad things happen. You're going to have autoimmune destruction with your T cells, right? And so can you see that sort of controlling this and saying, like, this is a good time to be activated, T-cell. This is a time where you should be activated. It's sort of a nice control. Because we're presenting self-peptide all the time. And so we kind of need a way to tell the T-cell, is this a normal situation presentation? Or am I suspicious? that something bad is happening because one of my PRRs got triggered. So if my PRR got triggered, I'm suspicious, and I really want you to do something. Does that make sense? All right, I'm going to complicate it with one other little piece, and then we're going to go to the next <laughs> slide. So somebody also might hear all of the things I just said and say, well, Dr. Barker, that's, that's, that's all well and good, but remember, we have central tolerance mechanisms. We have that mechanism to get rid of self-reactive T-cells in the thymus. So maybe if we're presenting a self-peptide on our dendritic cell, maybe the T-cell, the, the, the matching T-cell, doesn't exist because it got removed by central tolerance. So we, don't, we shouldn't have to worry about this whole situation. Any reason why you, that might not be true, why you might have to worry about this whole situation? With T cells and self reactivity, yeah, Joel. Yeah, all T cells are somewhat self reactive. So in fact, every T cell potentially could respond to some self antigen that's getting presented. And if you just let that happen all the time, then you'd be making a lot of self T cell responses, and you'd be really, really having some serious uh, issues. And so remember that we said that central tolerance has some little flaws in the plan. And happily, we have peripheral tolerance as well. This signal two situation and the requirement for signal two is part of the peripheral tolerance mechanism. This ensures that there is mi something microbial around, something that is non-self that was triggering PRRs and triggering um, the production of signal two, our co-stimulatory signal, in order to turn on our T cells to help prevent possible turning on of those self-reactive T cells and help prevent autoimmunity. Sometimes when I talk about the thymus and how every T cell that leaves the thymus is self-reactive, students will leave and they'll be like, I don't know how I'm alive right now because all of my T cells are a bit self-reactive. And one of the answers is because your T cell can't actually get turned on the first time unless CD28 is around to get to fully give that second signal. Um, if we don't have CD28 around, or if we don't have B7 around to, to ligate uh, CD28, and that comes from a PRR, then we're not going to get that T cell turned on. Yeah, Josh. to distinguish like well one we know T cells are super super self reactive so mm -hmm. if you just had T cell signal it could go very wrong. Right. Right. But the J cell kind of act as a checkpoint to be like, okay, yeah, no, this is actually So that's kind of the theory with the danger signal hypothesis. Yeah. Is that the the because we need both innate and adaptive, you know, we need the innate PRR signal to really activate that dendritic cell and activate B seven production that it is kind of this additional check. So does this make sense as a sort of general scheme and a nice way of 
being, as Josh points out, kind of a, a safety check for those T cells. So what would it mean if there was a situation where a T cell saw signal one, it saw MHC plus peptide, but it did not see signal two. And again, we're in the periphery. That cell, it's fine. It's first time. It's a naive cell. It's the first time it's ever saw its antigen and it's seeing that antigen without signal two. What does, what, when is that happening? What kind of situation is that happening in? When might that, when could that possibly happen? Yeah, Josh. Maybe it's a couple bodily microbes that help us out. Right. So they're kind of used to so they may they may see something, right? And they may it's like so but in terms of since they're not they're actually not really a, a foreign, it's not really a threat, that's second. So so that the, the situation that you mentioned here is a hot topic of debate in the field and we don't totally understand that situation. So Interesting point. I am not touching that with a ten foot pole. <laughs> um, okay, so let's so let's imagine this. When is another time when a T cell could see signal one and not signal two after it leaves the, thy the thymus? You're giving your immune system a lot of credit. What if it sees self antigen? What if it was like a self-reactive T cell? And it was kind of a bad self-reactive T cell, but it made its way out of the thymus. And then it found its self-antigen, right? That would be a situation where it was seeing signal one and not signal two. For reasons that I don't entirely understand, when I have written about things, kind of scenarios like this on an exam in the past, I have mentioned a T cell escapes the thymus. And for some reason, that the idea that it escaped baffles people and that means it like got out and maybe wasn't supposed to <laughs> so if the t-cell is seeing self antigen in the periphery you definitely don't want activation to happen right but is there anything that would that you kind of do want to have happen yeah grace get rid of that maybe you want to like actually not usually get rid of, but turn off that T cell. Remember with B cells, we had that option to turn the B cell off, and that happened during B cell development. It was called energy. In T cells, energy happens in the periphery. In T cells, energy happens if the T cell happens to see signal one without seeing signal two. So if the first time a T cell sees its antigen, it sees signal one and signal two, the T cell gets activated and goes out and like kill stuff. And if the first time the T cell sees its antigen, it sees it without signal two, it gets a signal like, you're kind of scary. You're kind of sketchy. Please turn off. Um, and so signal one and signal two together are required to activate the T cell. And if the T cell gets only signal one, maybe it escapes the thymus and goes to the brain and recognizes something in the brain. Not only does it not get activated, it gets actively turned off or energized. Sometimes people ask a question at this point of what happens if the T cell gets signal two but not signal one? And the answer is nobody cares. Yes. <laughs> um, yes. Yes. Uh, no, there are situations where this can go wrong. Um, and when we talk about peripheral tolerance, we will see some of those situations. Um, and so the next couple of slides are kind of telling you stuff I've already told you. Um, so remember, every T cell coming out of the thymus is a little bit self-reactive. It had low affinity for self-antigen. So that's why it's a risky T cell. And we want to have these controls. We want to have these guardrails. And the reason why that, why this works is because remember that T cells are only recognizing a small peptide from our microbe. And that a peptide from our microbe may in fact be kind of similar, but not exactly the same as a self peptide. So if we have low affinity to a self peptide, 
For example, if we have low affinity to the acetylcholine receptor, we might have high affinity to this similar protein that has 50% of the amino acids that are the same, or two-thirds, or whatever that fraction is, and some other ones that are different. And that is from poliovirus. And so then is we just make sure we don't respond to acetylcholine receptor because we don't have the signal two around, but in fact, we can then respond to polio really well. Um, and so that's sort of why this cross reactivity is really why we need to have these self reactive cells um, and why we want to energize a cell if it sees its antigen without signal two. And we want to activate that uh, cell if we see the antigen with, with signal two. Um, and so, like I said, um, the stuff that you were reading about for the PRR assignment was, in fact, about this way that scientists kind of figured out that the innate and adaptive immune systems were linked, that the PRR systems were actually linked to turning on an adaptive immune system, immune response well, and the idea that PRR signaling, particularly in both papers through TLR4, could turn on um, Co-STEM, and I know in the Medzatov paper they measure B7. I don't remember if they call it B71 or B72 or CD80 or CD86, because to a lot of immunologists, those words are all interchangeable. Um, so I don't remember which one they call it. But um, and in fact, that kind of won the Nobel Prize because it allowed us to sort of understand the linkage here and the ways we might manipulate um, responses. Um, This is also really important because if I do an experiment where I want to turn on T cells in a dish, um, the way that I have to do that is I have to remember that T cells need signal one and signal two. And so I have to provide both signal one and signal two in my dish. If I only provide signal one in my dish, then the T cells are going to get energized and I'm going to make a dish full of energized T cells. And so I have to figure out a way to give the T cells both signal one and signal two, whether I'm doing this in an organism or whether I'm doing this in a dish. Um, we can use different um, drugs to mimic signal one. We can also use antibodies that bind to these proteins and basically trigger them in the same way that their ligand would. And so we can just use one of these signal one triggers and we don't really get much T cell proliferation. T cells don't do much. We can, but if we add a signal one and a signal two, we get really, really good activation of our T cells. Um, and so this information is key for immunologists in setting up T cell experiments. Um, but there's also one other, well, there are this whole other area in terms of COSTIM or co-stimulatory molecules to talk about. I told you that we're talking, that I've just been mentioning D7 for co-stimulatory molecules. In reality, there are tons of co-stimulatory molecules that are involved with different kinds of T cells. Um, some of them are on naive T cells like CD28. There are other types of co-stimulatory molecules that are important on things like activated or differentiated T cells um, or um, in a variety of other situations. So B7 is sort of the famous one for naive T cells. But I'm going to mention two others. Um, really here um, in a traditional immunology class, you mentioned one other one. But the two other ones have gotten linked in the field in a few different ways, so I'm going to have to mention them both. Well, also because they're interesting. Um, and the what you can notice with some of these different co-stimulatory molecules, this is, and on the left, you're seeing um, different co-stim molecules that are present on an APC. And here you're seeing ligands on the T cell. What you might notice is that sometimes, like with CD28, the molecule gives the T cell a positive signal or a plus. You see it's a green plus. But there are other times where it gets a different kind of signal, a negative signal. 
shown here as a red minus. And so I also need to tell you about this important um, protein that's involved in negative signaling here. Um, when I was going through papers for next week, and when I was going through the 11 billion papers that I was thinking about, um, one of the papers I almost picked, uh, well, actually the paper I did pick, but some of the papers really talked about the, what happens if the negative stuff, what happens if you don't have the turning off of T cells? And we're gonna see in a little bit either today, so maybe today, maybe um, Monday of if you can't turn this off, bad stuff happens. T cells have to be turned off at the end. They can't stay on for a super long time because if they're turned on for too long, then they go start attacking those self things that they were yeah, responsive to. So if you have too much T cell turned on, if you can't turn off a T cell, you're going to end up with autoimmunity. And in fact, there are some pretty famous autoimmune diseases that all have to do with um, not being able to turn T cells back off. So knowing about this co-stimulatory molecule that is involved in turning T cells off is really important here. Um, and so what you can notice is on the left, we can see a T cell, which is in blue, and an antigen presenting cell, which is in yellow. Um, and we can see this antigen presenting cell um, presenting on MHC class one um, to the T cell, as well as presenting some B7 or expressing some B7 in order to ligate CD28 and give that T cell signal two. So the T cell gets signal one and it gets signal two. Yay, we turn the T cell on. Once this T, and this T cell is a naive T cell. When this T cell gets activated, this T cell starts making a new protein. In reality, it starts making many new proteins, but there's just one that I'm talking about right now. And that new protein is called CTLA-4. And you can see CTLA-4 being made here in this image from your textbook. I'm going to show it to you on another image um, on the next slide, and then I'm going to come back to this slide. Um, so what you can see is here is our naive T cell. And when that naive T cell gets activated, it starts to make new proteins. Like, for example, that IL-2 receptor we were talking about before. But it also might start making CTLA-4. So you can see as that T cell gets fully activated, it starts making CTLA-4. All along, it's been making CD28, which is in green, but not labeled here. Okay? CTLA-4 is really important because it's the off switch for the T cells. It's the thing that allows the T cell to be turned off. So basically, once you turn a T cell on, the T cell starts to make an off switch to allow itself to get turned off. So the T cell is like, okay, you've turned this me on, but it would be bad if I'm on forever, so here's a way to turn me off. And so as that T cell gets activated, it starts making CTLA-4 so that it couldn't get turned off and isn't going to, won't be on forever and ever. Um, CTLA-4 is really interesting because CTLA-4 also binds B7. It binds the same thing that CD28 does. So you can see B7 binding to CTLA-4 here. It was binding to CD28 before. You will notice, and so you can see that when the T cell is getting signal one and is getting CTLA-4, then we stop. We inhibit the T cell activation and we turn that T cell off. So in fact, it's not even like a different thing that turns the T cell off. It's like you give the T cell some stimulation and then if you keep stimulating it, it's like, okay, I'm off. I'm done now. So it basically becomes turn offable and then gets turned off by the same thing that was turning it on. One other thing to note here is that when you're looking at this activated T cell, um, the activated T cell still has CD28 on its surface. 
CTLA-4 is able to bind B7 way, way, way better than CD28 is. So if, if there's a competition between the two of them, CTLA-4 always wins and gets the B7. CTLA-4 very much preferentially binds B7. And so if CTLA-4 is around, it's going to get all the B7. Um, CD28 is not. So we're not going to be able to continue to signal and turn on that T cell. Um, as I mentioned, um, there are lots of co-stim molecules. The really famous ones are CD28 and CTLA-4. The other one I just want to mention, I'm going to mention quickly, is called PD-1. And PD-1 is another one of these negative um, co-stimulatory molecules. Um, here at the top, you can see our dendritic cell and our naive T cell. And you can see our dendritic cell giving signal one and signal two to our naive T cell. And now that T cell is going to become active. And that T cell is going to put CTLA-4 on its surface. And now we're going to um, not be able to turn that T cell on. We're going to inhibit that T cell getting turned on. If at the beginning that T cell was not a naive T cell, if now this was like a T cell that was activated, this wasn't the T cell's first rodeo. This wasn't the T cell's first time seeing antigen. Instead, uh, it might then turn on a slightly different kind of costim signal or costim protein. And now we might see PD1 being important in turning off that T cell instead of CTLA4. But it's really kind of conceptually the same idea. Um, the paper that we're going to talk about, oh wait, never mind. The paper that I almost picked was going to be about PD-1, but then I didn't pick that one. That's fine. Um, one thing that I want, one reason why I want to point all of this out is that we have found that if you just keep hitting a T cell over and over and over again, that T cell actually goes into a state known as um, chronic exhaustion. So T cells can go into a state of exhaustion. We all can understand this this time of the semester. Um, and that T cell actually should originally be able to make a whole bunch of cytokines and proliferate and do some functions if it's a CD8 like killing. And as that cell gets exhausted, it loses its ability to do all of its functions and just dies. Um, and PD1 is a key part of this. One of the reasons why I make sure to sort of bring up um, both CTLA-4 and PD-1 together here is that, as you can see, they're both really important for turning off T cell responses, just in slightly different contexts. Um, people have realized that there are some disease states where the problem is too much T cells. <laughs> Where the problem is your T cells get, uh, are, are going too much. And there are also some situations where your problem is that your T cells got exhausted. Your T cells got negative signals through PD1, for example, and lost their ability to function. And if you could unexhaust those T cells, if you could unnegative them, negative the negative, <laughs> right? You could maybe turn the T cells back on and have them work again, and everyone would live happily ever after. So in, you could imagine if you could mess with these negative signals, either turning them off when you don't want them or turning them on when you do, you could really impact a lot of disease states. And so people have figured out some ways to act, some little molecules <laughs> that actually can block CTLA4 or block PD1 and sort of mess with um, these co-stimulatory signals. This process is known as checkpoint inhibition. Um, and the idea here is that, for example, if we want our T cell to never get inhibited, we can just block CTLA-4. And then we can't turn that T cell off. And if we, if we want that T cell to keep doing its thing. This could be particularly important if we had a T cell that had gotten exhausted and we want to stop its getting negative signals so it could maybe like take a rest and come back. 
um, we could do that. And in fact, we can often do that when we have an exhausted cell. We might block PD-1 with an antibody and turn the T cell back on. Drugs that block CTLA-4 and PD-1 are called, as you can see, checkpoint inhibitors, or this is called part of checkpoint inhibition. And this is the absolute hottest cancer therapy that's out there. The, one of the biggest problems with cancer is actually your immune system does work against uh, tumors. T cells do a bunch of great work against tumors, and we'll talk about that later in the semester, until eventually the T cells get exhausted and stop working. And so if you basically just let the T cells turn back on, they usually can get rid of the tumors, or they can, in some cases, get rid of the tumors. And so checkpoint inhibition is, um, there are ways of sort of messing with this for a number of places where we deal with exhausted T cells because we just negative the negativer. <laughs> um, there are also some ways that we mess with these for some autoimmune diseases. And I don't remember what year it is. I'm making this up. 2016. Um, the Nobel Prize was given for the discovery of CTLA-4, uh, CD28, and PD-1, um, and their use in checkpoint inhibition. Um, and I just can't remember exactly which year it is. Yeah, Josh? So you think that over time, would you, is it, is it possible that over time, the individual can have, like, let's just say, for example, less of a, of a PD-1 response? So it's like, it, like can, <laughs> basically, can that inhibition grow over time? So, so PD-1 is, PD-1, it can, is part of exhaustion. So actually the PD-1 response grows over time. So yes, absolutely. Your PD-1, you will get this exhaustion phenotype increasing over time. So at the beginning, when the cancer first starts, which again, we'll talk about this later, your T cells are doing great. Then they start getting some PD-1 on them. They start getting exhausted. That grows over time. And now the cancer can win. So yes, it, it does change very much over time. I, I was on the fence between two papers. One of them was like a big PD-1 paper, and now I'm feeling slightly sad about that. But that's okay, because I love the one that I picked. Um, so um, all of these details are things that will happen with T cells in the periphery. So what we've seen so far is this naive T cell that has come out of the thymus and interacted with an antigen-presenting cell. Um, to then um, start making some IL-2, to start proliferating. Um, and this is happening because of, you know, signal 1 and signal 2, which you can see here. But now that T cell is going to gain some new functions. Finally, that T cell is going to be able to do something about a pathogen. And so when we think about what's going on in terms of... Um, What's taking so long with an adaptive immune response? It's because we needed all of these events to happen. And then, in fact, we need these T cells to leave the secondary lymphoid organ. See, we're in lymphoid organs. To go to the tissue where the infection is and actually do their job. And the T cell, at the beginning, this naive cell, which has not seen signal one and signal two, it doesn't know how to do its job yet. It only learns how to do its job after it's seen signal one and signal two and gotten this activation process. So yeah, it comes out of the thymus a CD4 or a CD8, but it doesn't actually know how to do its CD4 or CD8 job until it first sees antigen, gets signal one, signal two, and some cytokines. Um, the next part of this is me moving into actually those functions and how the T cell does something. Um, it doesn't make sense for me to try to tell you about it in one minute, but there is one thing I'm realizing I forgot to sort of mention in the past, and it fits in here nicely, and it fits into one minute, um, which is note this proliferation that we see, right, that's in clonal expansion. We told that T cell, you're a good, useful T cell. We need an army of you because bad stuff is going on. Your antigen is around. You need to make many, you need a whole bunch of friends <laughs> so that you can go kill that thing. And eventually... Those, all those cells are going to go out into the peripheral T cell and deal with the microbe. There's one thing that um, you actually already knew all about this. You already know about that clonal expansion that happens. You just didn't know that you know it. So when that clonal expansion happens, where is it happening? It's right on the slide. 
Yeah, Kara. In the lymphoid organ, like in the lymph node or in the spleen, you have a bunch of cells dividing and proliferating and making way more copies of themselves. What's going to happen to that area? Like if, if all of a sudden you all made 50 copies of yourselves, what's going to happen, Vicky? Well, first it's going to get crowded, right? It's going to get real crowded in here. And then it's going to have to swell to have enough room. Yeah, when your lymph nodes swell, that's because there is this expansion happening in the lymph node um, before those cells are heading out. And so when you think about swollen lymph nodes, people talk about swollen glands. They're not actually glands. That was a mistake somebody made in anatomy a lot of years ago. Um, but when you talk about kind of that swollen lymph node, it's because of that clonal expansion that has happened um, as a result of T cell activation. So, and it gets crowded and you have a lot of those cells that are getting ready to go out. Um, so we'll talk about the functions of uh, CD8s and then CD4s on Monday. Some of it may trail a little bit into Wednesday with the paper, but that's okay. Um, and I will see you guys next week. Remember your assignment is due by five.